pretty solid turnout and it looks like we have from all over the world ireland chicago missouri india oh, another south texas area vermont very cool exciting guys thank you everyone for joining across multiple time zones good morning good afternoon good evening um i think we're gonna dive right on in so again welcome to the technology integration in vertical farming um, sponsored by Montel. Excited to be here, excited to have our panelists. We're gonna have a very exciting conversation about really what it takes to um, build a vertical farm from the equipment standpoint. So um, vertical farms, controlled environment agriculture integrate lots of different equipment components into one facility. It could be HVAC, racking, irrigation, sensors and controls, um, and that can be very overwhelming and challenging to an entrepreneur or anyone really joining the industry on how do you evaluate the right providers, the right technologies, and the right equipment for your farm. And, you know, to kind of illustrate just how overwhelming it can be, um, if you haven't already seen this graphic, but Better Food Ventures put out their indoor ag tech landscape graphic in 2021, and it shows the components across multiple the, the technologies across multiple components and all the companies that are a part of that. So like, I think this is a great illustration of just like how fast um, and growing our industry is and just the different types of companies that are active in the space. Um, and I'm excited here today to have three of those companies really kind of share their lessons learned, their best practices, um, and have this discussion about, you know, what, what can be done and what should be what should entrepreneurs be aware of as, as they approach, you know, developing their own vertical farming business. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Will to do an introduction. We'll go Will, Patrick, and Alex. And then from there, we're gonna dive right on in. So um, Will, introduce hey. yourself. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, nice meeting you, everyone. So my name is William Fournier. I'm the uh, brand ambassador for Montel, uh, specialized in uh, vertical agriculture systems. Um, I also work for Canna Nutrients, which is a Dutch uh, liquid fertilizer company based in Holland, but uh, for the Canadian division. And uh, also own a small cannabis facility where I live on my farm. You can see a picture of a, a grow room in the background here. So um, I'm pretty much all in into the Canada space uh, since uh, many years too. So that's about it uh, for me. Nice meeting you. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Patrick. Actually, wait, Will, remind us where are you calling in from? You may have said it, but I want to hear it one more time. I'm sorry. If... Where are you calling in from? Oh, I'm from Montreal, just outside of Montreal in Quebec, Canada. Sorry about that. Perfect. Perfect. Patrick. Yeah, I'm a director of business development for BIOS Lighting. So we provide high performance uh, lighting for horticulture, um, whether it's, you know, CEA indoor or greenhouses. Um, I'm calling in from uh, central Illinois. It's uh, Peru, Peru, Illinois. <laughs> Very nice. And Alex. Uh, thanks so much, Jeffrey. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alex Babich. I am the founder and CEO of Neurovine. Um, we're a new company. We've been around for about five years. Uh, I started the business at my school, City College of New York. Uh, we developed the business for several years in New York City, and now we're located in upstate New York and Woodstock. And uh, we developed one of the best uh, dosing systems for recirculating applications. And we're now moving into uh, other controls uh, for irrigation and uh, even beyond that for full, full facility control. Amazing, amazing. So we're gonna dive right on into our questions. Um, maybe to start first, I'll, I'll go to you, Patrick. And you know, the first question really is, you know, what do you and your experience, um, what do you see new CA entrepreneurs struggle with most when it comes to selecting their equipment and, and their technology? Uh, probably the vast amount of choices and how all of those are gonna work together. Um, because yeah, you can't just, pick out one singular thing and not know how that is going to work in the racking with all the other equipment. Uh, you know, I, I have the lights, so those usually go towards the top of the rack, but you know, there's other things to consider, uh, like air movement, uh, you know, nutrient delivery stuff, wiring, plumbing. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, it's just a challenge to 
uh, really get all the details of what all the products can do, where they're all, where they all fit like physically. Um, and yeah, how that can all work together. I mean, I'm curious, like do, does like size play uh, a factor in that? Like, is there a difference between a small vertical farm, a medium sized vertical farm and like a large size vertical farm? Um, and do you see different challenges from entrepreneurs in those different categories? Um, not in, in, in equipment selection, it's not so much. I mean, the smaller you are, the more difficult it can be uh, to be profitable. So sometimes people will start with a small farm just as a proof of concept before building out larger. So, I mean, that's a challenge. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe going over to you, Will, I'm curious as to, you know, what kind of, you know, um, struggles do you see new entrepreneurs face when it comes to like, selecting their equipment? Uh, it's a great question. I think it's, uh, it's super overwhelming because uh, I, you don't know really exactly what you, um, what you want. I think that the, 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 the most difficult part when you start a project is to, like, to narrow down exactly what uh, will be your your, um, your your market positioning and uh, to define properly your goals and to follow and to follow it so it's it's all about this so sometimes uh, you uh, you want to start projects and uh, it's difficult to uh, to really focus on what what is it gonna uh, work at the end and you don't want to lose yourself with too many uh, too many opportunities and options so this is uh, one of the biggest uh, challenge I think for, for new project starters. And, and maybe from you, Alex, you know, what, what is your take and experience been like with this? Yeah, um, so I mean, so we've seen like a lot of stuff since we've entered the industry several years ago. And like, there was, there's this one case in particular that comes to mind. Um, so basically like our doser, it works for recirculating hydroponic systems, but a lot of people that are doing cannabis, they also use drain to waste. So you're basically like, getting a, a batch of nutrients, kind of just sending it to the plants, letting it go into the drain and, and that's it. And so for those drain to waste systems, like it does make sense to have like a um, centralized dosing system. So it's just sending things out all over the facility. But if you're using like a recirculating system, then it definitely makes more sense to have like each individual's like recirculating system monitored and controlled. And so uh, this person was building a, a large facility with uh, over 30 different recirculating systems. And we came up with a, a quote for him, like, you know, that was going to be about $120,000, which is not that bad considering the size of the facility. And then it also came with like installation for a little bit more, um, but we had everything figured out. But what ended up happening was he was talking to another company that was doing a central dosing system. And so they, I guess they're better at sales than we are. Cause we, you know, we have a great product, but I guess they're better at sales. So they convinced him to go with theirs, which was more expensive not including the installation. And I was like so passionate about this project because like this is a big deal for us. So I even went all the way to Michigan to try to convince him to change his mind and get other people. But they, you know, he just was set on his ways. So he ended up not going with us. And then he ended up getting this other system, uh, which now it's like costs a lot more money and they're having trouble figuring out who can install it. And I just also foresee a lot more problems uh, happening because of it. And I think another one of the problems is like they had a lot of money, but they didn't really have the experience. So um, I guess like the long story short is, you know, you just have to make sure that you you're do your due diligence. Uh, don't get sold on any one company. Make sure you're looking into a lot of different uh, areas, talking to people, not just companies, but, but also clients if possible. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, like what you were discussing towards the end there, like the installation component of this, like is also a huge challenge in in vertical farm, I would say, you know, whether it's a large scale facility that requires, you know, engineering, procurement, and construction, or a medium to small size facility that might be done by a general contractor or even your team yourself. Like, you know, what do you guys see um, mistakes? What kind of mistakes or like what kind of approach do you recommend when it comes to the actual installation of your equipment? Maybe starting with uh, Will first. Yeah, um, I think the the most common mistake that I've seen in, in uh, large scale project most of the time is the lack of different really well detailed layouts for for everything in the facility. So uh, the HVAC, the electrical, uh, the irrigation, the rackings, the, like each elements, each equipment needs to be perfectly integrated and 
you really have a, a, a clear vision of a project when you can start to multiply this, these layout. And this is how you see the potential issue with everything that you put in place in your project. So most of the time, the entrepreneurs, they, they rush things and they don't necessarily work with a firm that can really do a great job uh, providing this really, really tight uh, layout planning for all the elements. But on the other side, there's some engineering companies that they go too far in that field too. So you have to find the, 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 the middle if you want. Like you, you don't want to rush things. You need a good planning. But at the same time, like sometimes it can be like an extra load of work too. So you have to meet in the, in the middle. So, um, so, so like all the installation of equipment problem that I've seen on the field is because of a lack of planning with the proper layouts. Yeah. And maybe going to, to you, Patrick, like when it comes to installation, like what do you see from, from like your category of equipment? Uh, well, we try to, we just try to make installation um, options versatile. So there's, there's multiple ways. I mean, we have this rapid rack system that integrates specifically to Montel that makes things real easy. Um, just little tabs that sit on the lip of their uh, shelving. Um, but depending on other equipment selections, the style of growing, if, uh, if that's not available due to something else taking up that space, um, we have multiple other mounting points on the fixture. Um, there's T-slots on both ends to be able to install any type of hardware you might need to uh, work around any challenges. Um, I think building off of that, you know, because you th the three of you all come from different categories within the like landscape itself and because your technologies have to integrate with other technologies like how do you guys approach that you know how do you work with other equipment providers um and um how would you advise clients to like consider integrating different equipment providers into like their business maybe start with alex or sure yeah, with alex okay cool um yeah, I mean, so 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 for us, we uh, like because we make like a like a dosing system. Um, like for recirculating, it, it doesn't really require that many other components. But when you're dealing with uh, like a batch system, which we also make, it does require other components such as pumps, um, other solenoids, and things like that. So basically, we have uh, recommended different components to our clients to to use that we've tested and work well because we want to make sure that everything work seamlessly because even if uh, you know say the pump it doesn't work well that's going to kind of come back to us uh, as an issue so um, that's kind of what we focus on when we're talking about integrations um, but another thing that a lot of people are asking us for is custom things with our web application like a lot of people because our, our, our product collects a lot of data and a lot of people want to analyze that data and view it in different ways to help uh, with their workflow and so instead of us trying to cater to everyone's specific different need, I mean, because we also just, there's, there's data, but there's also companies that, that build like advanced robots and they want to talk to our system and send it commands and have it receive commands and all that kind of stuff. So we're just building a, a general API that's going to allow almost anyone that uh, can develop uh, code to uh, integrate with, with our products and um, control them and get the data and, and kind of do whatever they want. Moving uh, maybe to Will, you know, what is, what is your take? Uh, as for Motel specifically, uh, we do provide uh, like um, a 3D sketch, but not sketch, but 3D drawing of the, of the project. So every, every project is like custom most of the time. And it's really when you have this 3D, um, 3D images of your system that you can really see uh, the integration on everything else around the irrigation system, the HVAC, uh, your lighting, and uh, and all these equipment. So, so this is the way we work, and uh, it's a very powerful uh, tool uh, to really, really help to see the project where it's going. So, uh, like it, I, I would say, it's crucial to to have this uh, for our system. And Patrick, I know you, you kind of already spoke a bit more towards this, but I want to give you the chance, you know, is there any other strategies or other ways that, you know, your company interacts with other equipment providers um, in the space? Um, yeah, it's all pretty collaborative. I mean, because uh, we're going to, we're basically going to start where Will left off once they have their 3D drawing that shows me all the information of the racking. That's where I, 
I can figure out how to lay out our lights. Um, you know, the distance between the shelves is how I'm going to figure out the particular light levels for the crop they're growing. Um, so yeah, no, I, I find it be pretty collaborative. Um, on, on projects we do, I'm, I'm, you know, in contact with racking companies, with the with the nutrient delivery companies, controls companies, just to make sure everything is all going to fit together. And um, would, uh, I'm sorry, Jeff. I would add that, um, like in the early days of the cannabis industry, and maybe in the AG uh, industry too, uh, there was a lot of uh, secrets, trade secrets. So. The companies they, they were not like super open to share everything but i i find that the more it goes the more it's open and then the knowledge is now we know that every every facility every every system is different and it's not because you copy and paste one system that it's going to work the same in the other facility so uh i think it's getting more open and the collaboration is is better now than like five years ago let's say Yeah, um, I, I would definitely agree. I think, you know, that's like one of the bigger challenges in the industry is, you know, trying to share best practices and lessons learned, you know, among everyone that's trying to ultimately build, I think, a, you know, a better, more resilient food system. And, and vertical farming has a place in that food system. And I think um, it looks different in different locations, in different cities, different states, different countries. Um, And I think conversations like these help provide a bit more transparency around how, how to approach building your facility. Um, and I, I think with that, actually, one of our, my next questions, I think this is also a question in the Q&A, is like, you know, when you're working with a new commercial grower, like what kind of, what size farm do you typically recommend they start with? Or like, how do you approach the sizing of a farm conversation, you know, do, do entrepreneurs come with you? Do they say, I already know the size or do they come to you saying, you know, how big should we go to start with? I think it really depends of a lot of factor, but I go back to what I said before, it depends of the objective of the customer. So you really have to narrow down uh, your crop, your market positioning and your, your goals and then You can, you can start asking yourself, what are my ambition? Will I be the grower that's going to operate the farm or will I have like a, a huge team? And depending on uh, how, how, um, how big the investment you can do and your ambition, you can, you can size the farm. But naturally, I would say you're better to maybe start smaller and then uh, all of our system are scale. You can upscale easily. So uh, I like the concept of, Proof and concept, start small and then in increase capacity. That's the way I think usually. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, moving to Alex, I think you have a bit more of like a unique approach to this or a different approach because you're providing, you know, like dosers. And, and you know, that probably, the sizing of that is probably based off of the, the tanks and the water capacity of the farm. So I'm curious as to, you know, how you approach sizing for, for different farms and like what kind of questions customers ask you of, like, how do you size out the farm? Yeah, I mean, so so we don't usually like design the farms like we're kind of like at the end of the line because, you know, when you're developing a farm, there's a lot of factors that go into it, like, you know, constructing the building or picking out the space, picking out the racks, all like lights and stuff like that. So like the, the dosing and fertigation, that's kind of like the icing on the cake. Although, of course, you do want to make sure you have like if you have a large facility, you do want to have a nice big room, uh, you know, to have like your nutrient tanks and your, your stock containers and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I mean, for, for us, it's just like we want to know. Like how many different rooms do you have? Like how many different recipes do you have? How large are the tanks? Um, and, and, and for us, it's like the size of the facility doesn't really matter. It's just like how big is each individual reservoir because our pumps, like each individual pump can pump up to like 600 milliliters of solution per minute. Um, and so when you just kind of, you have to also think about what is the concentration of the solution they're using? Because say some of the nutrients are very concentrated where you only need to add like three or four milliliters of, of nutrients per gallon of water, where some of them are, are much less concentrated and they need maybe like 60 milliliters per gallon. So that actually plays like a huge role in, in figuring out the size. Um, but for our systems, like they're designed to work on a, on a pretty small scale. Like we've had growers that have used like five gallon reservoirs, like in their home with a, a little, a little tent. Um, I would say with that, it's a bit overkill with, with what we provide because it, it starts at about like $3,000. So 
you know, maybe if you're just really passionate and you don't want to have to spend a lot of time at your home, like, you know, you can use something like ours, but um, when you're getting to maybe like, you know, a thousand or more square foot, and obviously depending on like, you know, the value of your crop, that's when, you know, using a system like ours uh, would really make sense. And over to you, Patrick. Um, yeah, I'm usually not involved in maybe the, the early decision of how, how large to make the farm. Um, cause, cause as Will said, you first need to figure out your goals, then you're gonna, then you're gonna choose your real estate, see how much, you know, space you have to work with. Um, then you're going to go figure out your racking. Um, and then that's usually where we pick it up. So, um, I mean, we can work with anything from, yeah, from a, a home grower doing just a hobby, couple lights to, you know, multi-million dollar facilities, but but typically uh, there's a racking design before I'm even involved. So the size is somewhat determined already. I think uh, another question for you guys, and this might be just, just your, from your general experience or your understanding of the industry, you know, where, what kind of crops are you, you've seen that you would say are very standard within a vertical farm? And then maybe what kind of crops are you are excited about that you might see more of, you know, in the next few years to come. Starting with, oh, well, the, oh, starting with Patrick. Patrick uh, start oh, with yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, any any of the leafy greens, um, you know, microgreens, um, any different types of lettuces, uh, but something I'm starting to see a little bit of is some people doing some um, edible flowers or some flowering plants, um, just just for some variety and to add some different stuff to their to their product mix. Um, so that's that's always fun. How about you, Alex? Uh, yeah, I mean, so um, uh, basically, yeah, for, for most vertical farms, it's like, you know, microgreens, leafy greens, flowers, that, that sort of stuff. Um, seems like cannabis is now getting more into that where you have at least like two, two levels. Sometimes I've, I've actually seen like six where I've seen like um, them growing sideways through a trellis. And then they had like a bunch of racks that were and then like lights in the middle, which is pretty cool. I've seen that before. Um, but I'm, I'm really just excited about like very far into the future with vertical farming. Like, you know, I'm, I'm also just excited about like space travel going to like the moon and Mars and stuff like that. And so I think we're going to need to be growing like more like nutrient dense crops. Like, uh, I mean, like calorie dense, like soybeans. So I was learning about that a little bit. And basically it's not just about like, you know, the, the, the vertical system, but it's also about like the genetics, like trying to figure out how to reduce the amount of like waste material and get more of like, the the bean or, or whatever you're looking for so um i'm really excited about you know how things develop with that kind of stuff and you william yeah i think everything is pretty much possible nowadays uh but just like uh, patrick mentioned with cannabis uh, i've seen also a project on multiple levels but it seems like at two or three level it's uh if you go over it over over that yeah it's a bit more complicated because the manipulation of the flowers, the harvesting, the sanitation procedure and stuff, it's like super intense. So uh, the higher you go, the harder it is for your team to uh, navigate uh, within the, the, the system. But I see uh, a bright future for um, every uh, short cycle crops that they are not super intensive and they grow not super tall. Uh, I think there's a that's the, the most potential crops for the vertical system. Any, anything is possible, but not everything is, is profitable. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how the unit economics play out over time um, for different crops and different systems in different cities. So um, I think with that, I may have us take a quick pause, and we're going to do a short little presentation.
again, big thanks to Montel for, I think, you know, having us, bringing us together. Um, you know, we really appreciate the, the opportunity to, to sit down and have these types of conversations. And um, we'll be sure to send out, you know, a recap of the panel um, and including that, that video as well. I'm sure that'll be made available whether on their website or through a email distribution. Um, you know, before we move into to Q and A, I wanna ask you guys, you know, are there any questions here that, you know, we're not asking that um, we should address? You know, are there any critical topics or um, points of interest that you think would be of value to share with our audience? I have, um, I have a point uh, to share um, in regard to uh, design, uh, design planning for facility. I think one of the, the most like not misunderstood part for the entrepreneurs, but like a, a great uh, challenge that, that they, they, they face is the, the ratio of the canopy and the volume of, of growing that they will do versus the ergonomic space for their uh, workers. So uh, I found that overall, uh, it, is, it is a lack in many, many projects. So there's not enough working space and uh, for the, the workers. So if you start a project and you design a place, get in touch with us and uh, we'll make sure uh, it's, it's well made and uh, you, you don't want to like, invest so many so many uh, resources in a project where all your workers will be uh, stuck uh, navigating in a, in a too tight system that's my advice yeah i appreciate that um alex or patrick anything for you guys to to comment or add on yeah i mean i would almost piggyback off of that because um a lot of our installs are like uh, retrofit. So a lot of people already have a facility set up and then they're asking us to come in and add the fertigation system. So there's been a lot of times where like, I personally have been like stuck in a corner, like trying to set stuff up. Um, so I definitely think that it is very, it is good. Even if you don't want to like go ahead and buy everything all at once, it is good to think about uh, the, the big picture of, of how your farm is going to be set up. Cause I mean, one thing, like, you know, it seems like, oh, it's a good idea set up a farm, you'll make money, this and that, but there's going to be like way more problems than you can ever foresee. So the more thinking you can put in beforehand, um, there's just going to be less problems that you'll have to deal with in the future, even though there, there still will be problems. Appreciate it, Alex. Um, and Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I would pretty much just agree with that, that, I mean, you're going to get the best advice from, from, you know, reputable companies that have done it before. Um, to avoid some of those mistakes. Got it, got it. So I think moving into to some Q&A, so for those in the audience that do have a question, um, please use the Q&A function within Zoom so that we can address that. Um, I think I'm gonna start with this one from Steve Travis, just about um, energy usage and kind of addressing that. So maybe, you know, through your guys' experience, whether it's through your, your own technology or just through your, your general involvement within the industry, you know, what is your take on energy usage of vertical farms and how do we address you know, the, the um, heavy consumption that vertical farms do typically have on, on operations? Uh, well, I'm, I'm the most energy consuming one here. So um, now, I mean, our, our goal is just to make very energy efficient lights so, so we can produce, produce a quality light, um, you know, for the lowest, lowest operating expense. Um, so, I mean, yeah, our leafy greens, our vertical, you know, grow light, I mean, I believe is like a class leading 2.9 efficacy, um, which is, which uh, relates to lower energy usage. Yeah, I can add up that uh, vertical uh, growing system, uh, most of the time it's with LEDs. So uh, you, 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 of course it's, it's technically, I've seen project with HID lamp and HPF, HPS lamp, which are more consuming. But when you think about it in, uh, in one volume, when you multiply your uh, grow canopy, um, you can still save a bit on the numbers of, of units because it's like you have multiple chamber in one volume. So um, depending on the design and the crop you're doing, uh, I think you for, for sure, if you go vertical, you do some energy saving at one point. 
Yeah. I mean, and one thing what I'm thinking about is if I ever did want to build a farm, like I would want to try and use uh, <clears throat> renewable energy, like maybe have like a solar, you know, solar panels or something like that to really like offset the, uh, the amount of cost that, that the electricity is going to be using. Um, also, like this isn't something that we currently do, but it's something that I would like to get into is, as we develop our platform is monitoring the energy of all the different systems, like mainly, mainly like lighting and uh, HVAC systems. And then, you know, maybe with like having, you know, more data and analytics and really understanding the environment, figuring out ways that we could actually control the lights better or even provide insights to say, hey, like, you know, we've noticed that the cost is this high during this time, maybe you want to shift your schedules around so you could end up saving this much money. So that's like a, something we'd like to do in the future. Very cool. Um, Alex, actually one specific for you um, is from Felipe uh, Duca. What alternatives are out there recycling or cleaning nutrient solutions after use? uh what like you're saying can we reuse nutrient solutions or yeah so i i'm interpreting the question so felipe apologies if i get this wrong but what alternatives are out there for recycling or cleaning nutrient solutions after use so i think after they've gone through the system um you know what can you do with that next yeah i mean so um like with a recirculating hydroponic system i mean the the, the goal is to keep the water um you know, as long as you can, right? Because every time you have to like, you know, dump the water out, you refill it, you're wasting water, you're, you know, throwing away nutrients. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we provide is a bunch of different variables. So we have um, our pH, EC temperature. We also have something called like ORP, oxidation reduction potential. So that actually tells you uh, a lot of things, but one of the things I can tell you is if something's like growing in your system that you don't want to be there. So like, if you notice this number start going down over time and you're having trouble maintaining it, um, even if you're adding like oxidizing agents, which are pretty good too, like there's um, something called like hypochlorous acid, which you can add to the water and that keeps things like more sterile. So that can allow you to keep things for longer. Um, I mean, one of the issues also is that like, we, cause we also, we just use an EC sensor. So that just takes like a, a average of all the different nutrients that are in the water and tells you just the, all of them to combine, but it doesn't tell you what's there individually. And over time, um, those ratios could become imbalanced and not what the plants want. Um, so what you could also do is you could actually get a, a sample of your water analyzed and you could um, have that sent in to, to a company and then they can tell you what's in the water too. So if you're you know, paying very close attention to all the different elements that are in the water, you could then make some micro adjustments to the water and then hopefully uh, keep it going for longer. So um, yeah, so those are a couple of things that, that, that I would say. I guess, William, I'm wondering if you have anything to add to that based on your experience. Yes, yes. I, I think it really depends on uh, which type of crop you're doing, and then you can have uh, more or less possibilities, and, and also what is exactly your, your growing medium and your growing system. Uh, specifically for cannabis, uh, it's a plant that uh, is very good at uh, phytoaccumulation, so it can really suck up the heavy metals like really quickly. So if you don't have a proper fertilization program and you do recirculation and you have a problem with your inputs, you can uh, have problem with uh, your, your um, to pass the analysis at the end for your batches. So this you have to keep in mind. And the other one that I would like to add is uh, the challenges for the, the pathogens and uh, the disease. Uh, so depending of the crop you choose, you, you have like a, it, it's gonna it's gonna be different, and um, you need to have a proper UV system, and it's equipment that need maintenance, and it needs to have the the right capacity to do a good job. So uh, again, everything is possible, but what is your crop type? What mm -hmm. is your growing system, and and how is gonna work with your equipment? So and then and then you can you can evaluate the benefits and the the pros and cons of a, a system like that. Exactly. Um, a question for Patrick from uh, Maximilian Eastworth, and I apologize if I get these names wrong, but um, any thoughts on water-cooled growing lights for vertical farms uh, doing leafy greens? Um, I mean, it, it just adds another level of complexity. Um, you know, you're, that's, that's more, more equipment and infrastructure you're installing. Um, yeah, we, we don't, we choose not to do that. There's other, there's other thermal management 
options that uh, that work well. Um, so I don't think it's necessary, but it's it's doable. But specifically for microgreens, where you don't need a super high output of uh, of lighting. So I, I would say that if you have if you grow like extensive crop, that might be more interesting. But for microgreens, you just don't need such an intense light at first. So uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the water do, it does does help pull heat out very well. Um, but yeah, as as Will is saying, if you're looking at low light level crops, the heat isn't really an issue to to begin with. Got it. Um, another question from Michael Gonzalez, and you know, I think we've all kind of discussed. You guys have all discussed this on the panel already, but you know, for for someone that's starting small, um, what are maybe like one, two, three things for this in, an interested individual to to think about as they're starting, um, and then any thoughts or comments on how to get funded or investment. I'm gonna say that with the cannabis in Canada, it's very difficult if it's almost impossible. So to have a commercial loan for the cannabis industry, it's not conventional at all still. Um, but if you go with microgreens or any other like food crop vertical, there's plenty of option, uh, especially if you have diplomas here, I don't know uh, for, um, uh, elsewhere in Canada, but in Quebec, when, when you have diploma in horticulture, agriculture, and you start your own project, you have like a lot of open doors and a lot of uh, subvention available from the government. Um, I think I would add to that as well. You know, for someone that's new and interested, um, always start small, always pilot, always try to, to grow yourself to understand what that process is. And, um, you know, part of what you need to do as an entrepreneur is help develop, you know, the sales channel. And I think, you know, something I've heard common in the industry is that growing isn't necessarily the hard part, but marketing and selling can be very difficult depending on your crops, your location and, and the distribution um, and outlet that you're trying to approach, whether it's retail, um, restaurant chef, direct to consumer um, or another avenue. And I think, understanding who that customer is and exactly what they want is critical in determining like what is um, the right system or method to use to, to start your, your business. And, um, you know, that's something that we at Agritecture recommend. It's something that, you know, we allow users to play around with Agritecture Designer, you know, our, our software modeling tool where users can kind of plug in certain variables, certain crops and kind of get high level economics of what a potential model may produce and just kind of give you better insights as to like, what are the capital operational considerations um, and the crop considerations as you start going down this pathway to, to start a new business? I think, I think you're right on. And like, you have to ask yourself, am I a grower, uh, an entrepreneur? And am I good for to sell my crops too? So can I wear like the three hats and be good at it? If, if not, you have to be honest with yourself and build a team that's going to do it no matter the scale of your project. A question from Elizar Blanco. Um, and I, I hope you guys can answer this one. This might be a very specific plant question, but um, are there any root diseases that are a recurrent issue in vertical farming? Anything that you guys have seen or heard from your customers or clients um, in that capacity? Uh, I mean, the one that I've heard of is uh, Pythium or like Fusarium. And so, um, and that's like one of the reasons like why we monitor uh, things like ORP and we also monitor dissolved oxygen. So that way um, you can actually notice that like the dissolved oxygen can start like spiking downwards because uh, this root disease is consuming all the oxygen. Um, so, you know, again, that's something that we'd actually like to add to our system and like tell people, oh, like we've noticed this change in the data. You know, you may have this disease, go check it out. Um, but for now you can just view your data. And if you did notice anything, then you can go and, you know, see it before it, before it becomes a big, prob big problem. De definitely pitium. Uh, and because most of the time the growing system and vertical farming, uh, they are sterile at, at first. So 
there's nothing there naturally in place to fight off uh, the, the pathogen. So uh, it's definitely a challenge if you don't have a proper uh, irrigation fertigation strategy. A, another question from M Miguel Gonzalez, you know, specific to, I think, CO2 supplementation, um, you know, what is your, your take on CO2 supplementation and what is the best method for that um, for vertical farming systems? Um, CO2, it can be blended into the air like really easily. So the delivery met method uh, when it's close to your HVAC uh, air return and can be redistributed in, into your grow rooms, it, it's going to do it uh, properly. But it's, again, depending of, of your crops and your system. So uh, if you do uh, uh, intensive crops, uh, it's going to be a great investment CO2. And it's really depending too uh, about your uh, design of your HVAC system. So if you purge the air in a greenhouse, let's say, uh, for temperature, cooling, or humidity control, and then you throw out all your CO2, uh, then you really need to do a cost calculation if the 20, 25, 30% more in, in uh, increase in production will be worth it compared to your HVAC cost. Patrick, Alex, any, anything to add to that? Uh, I mean, I, I guess the only small thing that I that I can say um, from, from what I've seen is that like, we've had a, an issue where a customer was basically they had like CO2 in the air and it was getting pulled in through like their air pump. And then that was going like into the into the water and that was causing their their oxygen levels to, to decrease. So they ended up uh, moving uh, where the air was being pulled from and then um, they they solved that issue. Um. A question from Owen Lecky, and this is really kind of your guys' opinion and just through your experience, but, you know, where do you see the growth of the hydroponic industry growing, going from, from here? You know, what does it look like the next five, 10 years and, and onwards? And, you know, what do you think the impact vertical farming will have on, on the food and ag system? I would say more more greenhouse uh, for sure at large scale. Uh, if you see uh, the in Holland, uh, how many acres of uh, glass house they, they have there? I think we're gonna start to see uh, this in many many other countries uh, with the climate change. Uh, like at one point, we would not uh, be able to afford just outdoor crops. And we're going to see an increase uh, in uh, greenhouses con construction around the world. But this is what I think. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. Like, because um, I, I think a lot of people are always talking about, like, how can we, you know, solve climate change? And like, in, in my opinion, like, it doesn't look like we're solving it. It just looks like it's getting worse. And I think that, you know, mainly it's like we need to, like, survive. And so I think that it's, it's going to be more important to have more controlled environment agriculture, because like, as you know, our population is increasing, the land is getting worse, the climate is getting worse, like storms and things like that could affect, um, you know, our food system. And like, you know, it, we're, we're starting to get to the point where you imagine going to the grocery store, maybe something that you usually get is not going to be there. So um, I think that you know, just building bigger and better farms uh, all, all over the place and um, finding ways to grow more interesting crops. Um, I mean, another thing I hope hope for is that, you know, maybe the governments will actually step in and like fund uh, indoor farming more, like, cause you know, currently our outdoor farming systems are, are not actually sustainable. They're just funded by the government. So uh, I'm just hoping that, you know, the, you know, legislation can change and then there could, there could be more farms uh, that are doing things more efficiently all, all over the world. How about you, Patrick? Anything, anything to add? No, I can't, I can't really say what it'll look like 10 years from now, but I mean, right now there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of people figuring this out. A lot of smart people trying to solve, solve some of these problems. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's only going to get bigger and more advanced. Yeah. I think maybe what I would add to this is that, you know, in the U S we're starting to see um, city governments take, you know, 
I think bigger roles in um, the food and ag system through creating like offices of urban agriculture, hiring you know directors of urban agriculture, um, and starting to develop plans to help build you know stronger um, food and ag systems as part of like climate resilience and, and climate equity. And you know recently the city of Boston just put out saying that they're now creating an office of urban agriculture. We'll be funding more urban agriculture through one of their city departments. Um, New York City itself now has an office of urban agriculture that's going through the legislative process and you know, hopefully will be signed um, very shortly by the governor or by the, the mayor through their climate resilience plan. Um, the state of Atlanta has a, a director of urban agriculture and even the city of Dallas has you know, an urban ag coordinator and I think what's promising is that cities are now, I think, catching up actually, you know, to what the communities are already doing. And that is trying to build more localized agricultural production systems, um, you know, could be a soil based operation, could be a greenhouse or it could be a vertical farm. You know, all of these play a role within our communities and our cities. And I think that is very exciting to see. And I think from a global standpoint, you know, Singapore is one example where I see the government heavily investing in trying to fund different types of CA operations and facilities to help build this, you know, food and ag resilience. Um, so, you know, I think it's very promising what technology can do, um, what vertical farms can do for our cities. And um, I think it's a, an exciting time to be in ag tech, agriculture, uh, and urban agriculture. Um, Maybe backtracking a little, um, and maybe just as a, a question that I think has been answered, but just to remind the audience, um, Florian's asking, you know, what are each of the panelists' recommendations for for do's and don'ts for newbie vertical farmers that haven't made build and buy decisions yet? I mean, I would say, you know, you really should talk to Jeffrey, like, you know, this is what <laughs> you guys do. You help, you know, people get into the industry and you, you have your agriculture designers. So. I don't think I could be more helpful than you. Appreciate that. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, I, I think it's uh, to keep things simple at some time. So uh, like when you overthink a project and you try to do too much, like you lose focus and focus and, and sometimes like just keep things simple and it's gonna go well. Mm -hmm. And on your end, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I would say just, just work with reputable companies, hopefully some sort of consultants that can help help guide you through the process. Um, if you're trying to take it all on, all, all by yourself um, without having a lot of experience in any of the areas, um, it, it's just a daunting task. So work with uh, good people you can trust. I think from there, um, let's see what other questions we, we have in here. Um, here's one from Pablo, which I think it is a bit out of the blue and he says it himself, but, you know, have you guys heard of any vertical farms focused on propagation of, of high value tree species, such as rubber tree, mango, or avocado? So it's a bit more experimental, I think R and D, but curious to hear if you guys have seen that. I haven't seen it, but I did recently have a conversation. It, it wouldn't be like vertical multi-tier, but somebody was talking about growing apple trees indoors at CEA and, uh. It, it, that was pretty interesting. I, I'd be happy to see if that was successful. Yeah, I mean, so so one thing I heard about is because like, you know, thinking about, you know, growing food in, in like space and like, you know, very like space constrained environments, um, like growing a tree, it requires like a lot of like mass that's like not consumed. And so I was wondering if people have ever looked into like how to grow less of the tree and get the fruit. And I saw that there was someone that was actually growing just like a branch and it was like propagating like plums out of the branch. And also like the trees have like seasons, so they only grow sometimes, but this thing actually was growing plums all the time. So, uh, you know, I haven't really followed the research too much, but uh, it seems like something that's being worked on and um, something that I definitely would like to, to learn more about. And you, William, any, any thoughts on, on tree species or maybe any other like interesting crops that you, you've come across? Uh -huh. 
I, I think we could see a switch uh, from the con conventional nursery propagation, the way it's done, but within a, a indoor vertical environment that could become like very productive and efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the, the old production of a fruit tree, uh, I, I doubt that we're going to see this uh, uh, soon uh, indoor and vertical. Um, I think moving into just closing thoughts, are, are there any final words, resources, links that you want to share with the audience um, or anything else that comes to mind, you know, as we've had this conversation? Um, I would just say go to our website at biosliding.com. We've got lots of, lots of helpful information there. Well, same, same for us. Uh, on Montel's website, there's a lot of information. Uh, but uh, I, I would say if it's for uh, the cannabis industry uh, in Canada, there's a couple of nice events that you can attend, like exhibition, like the Lift Expo and uh, places like that. There's a couple of other shows uh, around uh, the year. And uh, it's where you can really uh, connect with people that... Uh, have project that are building project, and so this is a great source, great source of information. And Alex, yeah, I mean, so of course, like you know, our company is Neurovine, and so like if you're looking for uh, dosing for recirculating applications, um, I think that we're the best in the world. And if you find someone better, you know, please let me know. Um, but in terms of like, you know, everyone's at a different stage in the journey. So it's, it's really tough to say um, what you need to do, but like, you know, cause I, you know, I didn't develop like a farm, but I started a, com a farming company. And so uh, the way I did that was attending a lot of events. I did um, some of the agritexture events like five years ago um, in, in New York. Uh, I've done a bunch of different cannabis events as well. So if you're interested in cannabis, definitely there's a lot of trade shows and events for that. Um, so yeah, just, just try to get your hands into the industry. Try to like, you know, network with a lot of people, have these conversations. Like I used to just meet people at networking events, get their business cards, like have follow-up conversations with them, ask them a bunch of questions, see if that led me into from one thing into the next. So um, it's, it's definitely a journey. And so, you know, go on that journey and, you know, see where it takes you. Amazing. It's definitely a journey. It's definitely exciting to see like where the industry has come from and where it's going and, and, i um, very glad to be a part of it. I think with that, um, Alex, Patrick, and Will, I want to thank you guys so much for, you know, taking the time to be with us today. Um, a big thank you to Montel for sponsoring this and giving us the opportunity to, to come together. And most importantly, a big thank you to our attendees who are coming in from around the world. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you again for joining us. We'll be sure to follow up with some resources and links as part of this webinar. And I think with that, we are, we're all done here. So thank you all so much. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We are online and available. So have a great rest of your week um, and be well.